that, we've got a couple of our young men that are going to be uh, leaving us this week. We've got uh, Brother uh, Jalen, who is going to be heading back to Oklahoma on his way to, is it Navy or Air Force, Jalen? Are you heading Air Force or Navy? Okay, military. Pray for him. He's going back and he is jumping in. It might be Coast Guard. Might end up catching up with Ben again. And then uh, Benjamin, I saw him earlier. He leaves Tuesday for basic training. Uh, he, we're driving him. The military is always wise. He, he's got to go to Cape May, New Jersey. So they have us driving him up to Philadelphia, which, which is a little longer drive for us to, to get him to New Jersey. But hey, anyway, pray for him. We're going to have a fellowship this evening for both of those gentlemen. You're going to want to be here, have the evening service. And directly after, we want to say our farewells to them. Uh, they'll be back, I, I'm confident, but... Uh, uh, it is always exciting to see young men take those steps to move off. Of course, Benjamin and uh, uh, my son, my youngest son, it is hard to lose the baby of the family. Amen? Oh, my wife, she didn't even look at me. She just shook her head yes. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. We're going to read verse 18 down through 23. The Bible says, little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come even now as there are many Antichrists. Even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Here's what he wants them to know in verse 18. It's the last time. Right? It's not the end time. It's the last time. It's not the tribulation. It's the last time. It's the last time for people to be saved. It's the last time for the period of grace and the gospel to make an impact on the Gentiles globally because in the tribulation period, there's a change. There's a shift. He says in verse 19, they went out from us because they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. He says, listen, there are a lot of people who say they're believers, who say they walk with God, and then they depart or they fall into false doctrine. They didn't lose it. They never had it to begin with. But ye have an unction, he says in verse number 20. Who is this? The people who believed by grace through faith. You have an unction. That word unction means anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One. You, you have the Spirit of God that has come upon you, and ye know all things, he says. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. He says, listen, I'm writing to you because there is this thing that you know and it is the Spirit of God that bears witness to you. It is called the truth. And you know it. I'm not writing to you because you don't know the truth. I'm writing because you know there is the truth. And he says in verse number 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Who is a liar? Someone who denies the truth. He is antichrist. He is contradictory to the reality and righteousness of God. He denieth the Father and he denieth the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. We're going to pray and we're going to discuss the reality of of our third part, the war on the truth. You can go back to the last one, it's fine. I'm, yeah, they, thank you. Father, we come before you, we thank you for your goodness. And Lord, now as we get ready to uh, worship you in spirit and in truth, Father, this is not the pastor's show. This is not the congregation's show. This is your program. And Father, we pray that this morning that the Spirit of God would have free reign with his word to speak to hearts, that you would be with me, that I would not hinder the message that you have this morning, that I would just simply preach the truth of the word of God and the contextual reality of how it is presented with the power of the full context of scripture behind it, that you would be honored and glorified 
this morning. Again, Lord, we pray if anyone is here and they have not been born again, that today would be the day of their salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. The truth is not very popular in our modern days. As a matter of fact, the world has waged war on the truth. We live in a world where people are encouraged to, do, to indulge in their perverted fantasies and call this alternate state of perversion their truth. The reality is there is a war on the truth. John is speaking to this because this was taking place in his day as well. And there is a strategy that the world employs in their method of promoting the term their truth. They'll use media of all kinds to promote emotion and feeling as a replacement for ultimate truth for individual truth. If anybody spent any time on any of these social media, you're going to see videos and posts and pictures encouraging you to you do you. You live your truth. You be who you think you really are. And you may not realize that, but that is actually a war on the reality of truth. There's an attempt to replace Truth, when we say truth, absolute reality with my truth or your truth. But the truth is truth regardless of what you think about it. Truth cannot be replaced by the ever-changing impression of reality that has no grounding in facts but in the ambiguous nature of an individual's emotions. But this war isn't new. It began in the Garden of Eden when Satan declared war on the world and the truth that was in the world by saying, thou shalt not surely die. This was and has, this war continued through the ages and is raging in our world today. As a matter of fact, in a survey as of May of 2020, the cult, by the Cultural Research Center, 57 of American adults reject the concept of moral absolute truth as designed by a creator in favor of believing instead that moral truths are up to each individual to decide. Only fit 46 of those uh, who claim to be born-again Bible-believing Christians believe the Bible to be moral truth and absolute. Let me say that a different way. 46% of people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians believe the Bible because the Bible is our truth for morality, instruction, the moral law was not fulfilled. It will always be because it's natural law. Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law. He fulfills the um, ceremonial law and the, I'm drawing a blank here, civil law, thank you. And now we still have morality in the world today because that's designed as God started in nature. So the Bible is absolute. The authority of the Bible is absolute. The word of God is truth. God said he is truth. The spirit of truth. Truth is real. But only 46% of people who claim to be Christians <laughs> believe the Bible. People who are encouraged to live their own truth instead of conforming to the truth of the Bible end up adopting cultural's way of, a, of adapting. You understand that you will conform to something. 
And you're either going to conform to what the world's strategy is for your truth, or you will conform to the Bible, the things of God, the reality of Scripture. You will either do one or the other, because you can't do both. There is what we call pure truth. And pure truth is found only in God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12, the Bible very deliberately tells us, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The early church... Their main source of biblical knowledge came from the Old Testament scriptures, from prophecy within the early church. They did not have the completed canon of scripture. And there was a quite a bit of misinformation, pagan moral relativism, and Jewish legalism that was introduced to the churches. However, when John writes his epistle, he writes them and he tells them, listen, I have taught you the truth the real truth, the Bible truth, and there is no need to follow after the world's truth. You need to continue in the truth of the word of God. And he tells them in verse number 20 that they have an unction or an anointing by God to know the truth. That is the Holy Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God declares the truth to them. We have not received, what? The Spirit of this world. The spirit of this world will direct you to what? The things of this world. However, we have received the spirit which is of God. Why did God give us the Holy Spirit, the comforter, to teach us all things whatsoever we need to know? He says, this is why in verse number 12, that you have the spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. God is not trying to keep any truth from you. God wants you to know all truth. There's no hidden truth out there. It's right here. And the Spirit of God will teach you if you make this book your passion. John's reminding them not to be pulled into the lie of intellectualism, or philosophical debate in understanding the truth or the things of God, but rather rely on the Holy Spirit to give you insight and understanding. I am an expositionist. When I study, uh, uh, when I study the Word of God, I exegetically break down things, and, but I want to let you know I don't take the Bible and break it down so much that the Holy Spirit can't teach me. There are some people who, who diagram the word of God so much that they just take the grammatical meaning and they miss the spirit of God's authority in it. The spirit of God has to teach, not your carnal understanding of words and comprehension and concepts. It's the word of God by the spirit of God empowered by a true God who sent his true son to die in reality on the cross for mankind. That's truth. And so John is reminding them of this thing. What is truth? That's what Pilate asked. Truth, according to Webster's 1828, is conformity to fact or reality. Exact accordance with that which is or has been or shall be. The term truth is found over 235 times in the Bible. Now, that's just truth. Now, there are other variations. There are more than that. In the book of Psalms, excuse me, in the book of Psalms, the psalmist spends a lot of time talking about truth. In Psalm 25, 5, the Bible says this, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. In Psalm 31, 5, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O God of truth. In Psalm 40 and verse 11, withhold not thy tender mercies from me. O Lord, let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. Psalm 43, 3, O send out thy light and thy truth. 
Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and unto thy tabernacles. Psalm 69, 13, but as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord. In an acceptable time, O God, in the multitudes of thy mercy, hear me in thy truth of thy salvation. You know, we could go on and on and on and on. What are we seeing here? The psalmist in the Psalms, many of them written by David, uh, Asaph, and others, went through periods of time of struggle and difficulty, and they didn't say, God, conform to me. Let, conf- change your opinion of, of what is good. They said, God, let me conform myself to your truth. Let me be transformed to your truth. Let your truth lead me. Let your word guide me. Let your word be a light that brings me to where you want me to be. In the Gospel of John, John, the human writer of First John, spends a tremendous amount of time presenting Jesus and God as truth, wrapped in truth, actual truth. In John chapter 1 and verse number 14, he said, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John 1, 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And John chapter four and verse number 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And John 8, 32, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. In John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto them, unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 15, 26, when the comforter is come, which I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And in John 18, 37, Jesus told Pilate that he came to bear witness unto the truth. And everyone that is of the truth hears his voice. And Pilate was perplexed by this statement. Why? Because Roman paganism and intellectualism, relativism, they didn't comprehend truth. And so when Jesus said, I came to bear witness of the truth, And everybody who's of the truth, they hear my voice. He is perplexed and he asked the question. What was the question he asked? What is truth? What is truth? I believe we live in a world that is perplexed by the statement truth. We live in a world that has perverted reality to the point to where when you talk about truth, They don't understand the reality. We live in a world where if you say two plus two equals four, somebody's gonna say, that's not true. There are books written about why two plus two does not equal four. And then they say, well, if you look at it atomically, then yes, it is correct. But if you look at it abstract, well, abstract is it truth? It's abstract for a reason. I think we need to stop writing books about two plus two equals something else and say, hey, maybe I need to get a dictionary and learn words. Because if it's abstract, it's not what? If I told my wife I have an abstract love for you, (laughs) just visit me at the cemetery. (laughs) Why? Because she'd be like, hey, that's not truth. Right? This is the reality. Abstractively, I have 17 kids. What does that mean? Well, I got a lot of people in here I love and I help provide for and take care of. And I, no, but, but if they came to me and said, hey, can I get in your will? Abstractively, you are my children. Not that you're going to get much anyway because I'm a pastor, but that's a, a whole other story. What are we looking at? Truth. Our world struggles with the word truth. Struggles with it. But that's not new. 
That's not new. It is hard to see God as the truth of absolutes in a world where nothing is absolute. But may I share with you the reality, Jesus is truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The Bible is called the word of God and it is the word of truth. And so you and I don't have our own truths. God is not going to conform to your truth. You are called to conform to the reality of God's truth. Romans chapter 12 and verse number two. The Bible declares, and be not conformed to this world. Let me say it like this. Don't conform to your own truth. Don't conform to the truth of your culture. Don't conform to the truth that is perpetuated by media. Don't conform to the truth that comes from intellectualism. Don't conform to the truth that comes from philosophical uh, exploits. But don't conform to this world, he says. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean? I have to stop thinking about my truth and let the truth teach me reality of truth. Empowered by the Holy Spirit of God in a God of truth. And then and only then can we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you're trying to live your truth, you will not walk in the truth and in the will of God. You can't. You can't because they're opposed. They're contrary one to another. If you recall in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives an illustration as he speaks, and he talks about a two different ways, two different doors, two different paths. Both of them are marked heaven. One is broad, one is wide, and there are a whole lot of people walking on that path. And they are heading that way, encouraging others to follow them. You can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. You want to pretend to be a sheep or say you are a sheep? Come on, come on this way. It's marked heaven. And everybody on this path is going to live their truth. And they'll link arms and they'll sing and they'll say, we just want unity. Over here is a narrow path, a very narrow gate. It's marked heaven. There are only a few people on this path. But this path was given with directions that are true, given by the one who designed the path and the door and what's beyond the door. And these folks over here are walking and there's few and they're coming and everyone over here is saying, what is wrong with you? You're narrow-minded. You're closed-minded. And the people over here, they walk through that door and they fall off the edge into a devil's hell that was created for Satan and his demons that God never desired for a single person to go to. And when I conform to my truth, live my truth, do my truth, do me, this is always 100% of the time going to be the result because it's in contradiction to God's way. You cannot go to heaven. 
Let me say it this way. I, I, I'll say it differently. You cannot have a relationship with God your way. It has to be God's way. That's why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But it says something more. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the reality. And when we try to conform church or theology or whatever else to the world, to accommodate the world, we have broken away from God's path, God's way, God's plan. It's called another gospel, and no one will ever be saved by another gospel. Paul says it's not just another gospel, it's not a gospel at all because it can't save anyone. And so we say, Pastor, well, what, do you, what does this mean? It, it results in something. There's an expectation that Jesus has for each of us. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, now he's speaking to his disciples, but he says this to his disciples, if any man will come after me. Now he's speaking to his disciples, and it's good for their knowledge, but this is something they're going to take forward in the ministry that God calls them to. Right, John is here. The apostle John is a part of this group that hears this truth. If any man will come after me. John's listening. John hears this. And then Jesus says this. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. He has to conform to me. That's what Jesus is saying here. You can't have the relationship with the Father if you won't conform to Christ. How do you and I, you know, we talk about how precious we are in God's sight, you know, red, red and yellow, black and white. We are precious in his sight. Yeah, and that's all reality. That's true. But here's the reality. You know why you're, you're, you're saved? It's because of Christ. Because you are hid in Christ. And when the Father sees you, do you know what he sees? Christ's righteousness. We are washed in the blood of the lamb. He makes intercession on our behalf. It is all about Christ. And so if I want the relationship with the Father, I have to have a relationship with the Son the way the Son said for me to come. I can't do it any other way. But you know what? This message that I'm sharing with you today, this gospel truth, here, here's what it is. It is not popular in the world today. It is not popular, and then unfortunately, many groups that call themselves Christian are denying this. There are apostate groups that once preached the gospel. There's a group in America called the Episcopalian Church. The Episcopalian Church was a branch off of Anglican that came to America in the 1700s. It's congregational a design, but they preached the gospel. They had some other errors, but they preached the gospel. Today, if you were going to an Episcopalian church, you would not hear a gospel message. You would hear a social message. You would hear a whole lot about you conform to you. You be who you are. Why? A perverted concept that the world has adopted called love. It isn't God's biblical agape love. That is holy. It is the world's perverted concept of love. And John writes to believers. Why? Because they know the truth. They know Jesus. They know the spirit of truth. They know God's word. He's writing to them to remind them, 
to remember what they know and not get pulled away from the truth and the lies that the world is pushing. And he declares in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 21, I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And there's one particular doctrine that is constantly attacked. It's the doctrine of Christ. Because in verse number 22, you notice what John says. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the what? Christ. He says, who is a liar? Who is Antichrist? Who has the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world today? It is anyone who denies Jesus is the Christ. Well, what is meant by the term Christ? In John chapter 1 and verse number 1, that means Jesus is God. Here's the reality. If Jesus is Christ, he must be God. And in the gospel of John, let's just go ahead. We're, we're going to turn to several verses. Just get ready here to flip through. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse number 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as the, only, uh, as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, speaking of Jesus Christ. See, this is only Jesus fulfills this. Jesus has always been God and will always be God. Always. In John chapter 17, turn there with me. I would write these down for future uh, review as well because some of you will talk to somebody who will reject the truth and you will have some words to share with them. In verse number five, this is Jesus' prayer right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. What does that tell us? He's always been God. He's always been. Jesus is man and took on, I'm sorry, is God and took on the form of man when he was born of a virgin. In Philippians chapter two and verse number six. He is, he has never given up his deity. May I tell you that? Jesus has never ceased from being God. Just because he took on the form of a man here, we, we don't see that he stopped being God. He will all, it, it is called the hypostatic union of Christ, right? He is always God, but he is also man. Look at verse number six. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What's it saying here? He is God. Verse number seven, made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. What's he doing? He's taking on a nature of man. Verse eight, <clears throat> and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus is God. He's always been God. He'll always be God, but Jesus is man. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Matthew chapter five. If you want to sit and listen, that's fine, but I'm going to turn and read for you. Matthew chapter five. Verse number 17. I wrote the wrong scripture down there. I'll come back to it. First John chapter two and verse number two, he is the propitiation for our sin. He says in first John chapter two and verse number two, he says, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Hebrews chapter nine and verse number 12, he is the substitutionary sacrifice, eternal redemption for all mankind. Turn with me to Revelation chapter five. We'll go there in verse number eight. May I tell you that Jesus rose and he is victoriously reigning in heaven as we speak. He is worshiped by the heavenly host. 
And in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 8, we see Jesus as he is. The Bible says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seal. Therefore thou, hast, uh, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and every tongue and people and nation. Thou hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is the reality of Jesus Christ. When we say Christ, it is not just a term that is casually thrown around, it is specific. And most of the religions of the world have Jesus, but they don't have Christ. The Mormons have Jesus, but they don't have Christ. The Muslims have Jesus, but they don't have Christ. To Jehovah's Witness, have Jesus, but they don't have Christ. They don't see him the way the Bible depicts him. Who is a liar, the Bible says? Anyone who denies Christ. So if I acknowledge Jesus Christ, I have to acknowledge something else. Go back with me to 1 John chapter 2. If I acknowledge Jesus as the Christ, I have to acknowledge something else. Look at verse 25. We'll read verse 24 and 25. Let that therefore abide in you the truth, which you have heard from the beginning, that Jesus is the Christ, and that what ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you by the Spirit of God, constantly reminding you of the reality of the truth, bearing witness. Ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. In verse 25, and this is the promise that he has promised us. Even what? You don't get eternal life any other way, folks. You do not get eternal life any other. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't say enough prayers. You can't give enough money. It's only through Jesus the Christ. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. That's what he said. And we live in a world that has waged war on this. Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey says that there can't only be one way. There has to be multiple ways. Do you know that the Catholic Church teaches that Jesus is the way, but everyone who believes in God will come to the Father through Jesus even after death. The Reformed Church Protestant churches have a version of this. You know what that is? Conformity to the culture, not the Bible. Because you don't want to make people feel bad. You know, I am sorry that people who have never heard the gospel are going to go to hell, but that's what the Bible teaches. That's why the church is given the Great Commission. To do what? Go to these countries. I'm thankful we've got Olena here. Where is she? In Germany. Doing what? learning language so the best of her ability she can share the gospel with people who reject it. Thankful for the Lehman family for the last over 20 years staying in a country that it's hard to live in, Thailand. Learn a language that is crazy. I had an opportunity to go in Mrs. Hamilton's class and I went in and I, I, I you know, we were missionaries there. We understand that. And I, I went in and I started joking around. I said, hello, and talked with them in Thai for a minute. And they're looking, that's weird, pastor. Why are you doing that? because that's the language they speak. And let me tell you, I got her a lot wrong. But why did I do that? Why does the Lehmans do that? Because those folks need the gospel. What do we have? Thriving churches in these countries. You know, I'm sad that people are going to die, but church, we've got to step up. It's missions month. 
We, we've got to stand stir, uh, strong in doctrine, especially the doctrine of Christ. This is the pillar that makes us different from everyone else is the doctrine of Christ. And if we compromise there, we'll become what the world is. We'll become what the world is. Maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you have never called out by grace through faith. Don't leave here today without doing that. Because you can't get there your way. You can't be good enough. You can't do enough sacraments. You can't balance the proverbial balance well enough, the weight scale well enough, you'll always be on the losing side. But that's why Jesus came, amen? And if you'll just simply put your faith and trust in him, the Bible promises you'll be saved. It's not just a name, oh Jesus, it is the death, burial, and resurrection that Jesus is. The gospel he died for you because you couldn't save yourself. He was your substitutionary sacrifice. He appeased God with his blood and he opened up an opportunity for you to enter into a relationship with him. If you're here today and you've never done that, today must be the day that you put your faith in him. Let me have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Who would say this? Pastor John, Pastor John, I'm not saved. I don't know I've put my faith in Jesus Christ Please pray for me. If that's you, would you put your hand up? I want to pray for you. Pastor John, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure. Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Who would say this, Pastor? I know I'm born again. I know I'm saved. But if I were honest, the, the world is influencing me. And some of the things that I know the Bible teaches, I'm, I'm kind of struggling with because I've been, I've been taught all of these things from the world. Will you pray for me that I would just let the Bible be true and everything else be considered a lie? Would you pray for me? If that's you, would you put your hand up? I want to pray for you. Pastor, I, I, if I'm honest, I'm influenced by the world. Amen, I see, I see your hands. I see your hands. Pastor Lacombe, pray for me. I'm being influenced. I, I don't want to be. I want the Bible to be my influence. Please pray for me. Amen, you can put your hands down. And who would say this, Pastor, if I'm honest, I'm not, I'm not doing the job of the church. I'm really not being a witness. I'm not being a testimony. But God, God challenged me, and, and I want to be that. I want to do what the church is supposed to do. Would you pray for me, Pastor John? If that's you, would you put your hand up? I'll pray for you as well. Amen, I see your hands. See your hands. See your hands. Father, I come before you. I thank you for the folks who are here. And Lord God, now we just pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified. And Father, I pray that if there's any here who isn't saved, that today would be that day for all those who raise their hand indicating that, that they're struggling, letting the, letting the world influence them. Lord, I pray that you would draw them into a walk with you. And Father, for those who were, were honest and said they want to be the church and they want to do that work, Father, I pray that you would help us now. We love you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. The piano is playing. If God's